I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. sit down. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all. I'm delighted to have the Oxus Quartet. Well, I thought it was going to be a quartet, but it's expanded. It's fantastic. It's a members of the Abingdon Symphony Orchestra with whom Tony played viola. And I'm thrilled to bits to be sharing this service with the Reverend Helen Garton and members of the Congregation of the United Reformed 
church here in Cumnor. Kathleen and Tony have been valued members of both of our churches, and Tony has played the piano at the URC services. It's just lovely to have our two churches able to come together in this way, to show our love for Tony and to share our, uh, show our love for each other. After this service, um, the close family will be going to the crematorium. Please wear your face masks even when singing. I know it's a pest, but we need to keep each other very safe. Thank you. We meet in the presence of God, who holds the key of life and death. We meet to remember the life of Tony Bradley, to give thanks, to forgive, and to look forward. We meet to commit Tony and ourselves to God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, has passed through death before us. Just as you're sit sitting, we will pray. Eternal God and Father, we thank you that you've made us all to share life together, to love one another and to reflect your glory in the world. On this day of parting, we thank you that you will not abandon Tony, whom we love, nor will you desert us in our grief. And we hold before you now, Lord, for your gentle love and care over the coming weeks and months, Kathleen, Charlotte, Elizabeth, Richard, and all members of their families. Give them and us, dear Lord, courage and strength for today and hope and peace for tomorrow. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a prayer of confession. Lord God, we confess to you our regrets. We acknowledge what is past. Forgive us for the wrong we have done, for those moments when we could have taken more time, we could have said more, we could have said less. In this moment, give us grace to receive and to offer forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. God of forgiveness and love, even when our faith is shaken and we turn away from you. Give light to our footsteps, heal our wounds, and lead us to your truth, hope, and new beginnings. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we stand now to sing our first hymn, Lord of all hopefulness.
Jack is going to read our reading from the Bible, from 1 Corinthians. first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1, 1 to 3. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful, or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I become an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. Thank you all so much for coming to celebrate my father's life. Those of you here in Cumnor and those who can't be here but are joining remotely, wherever you may be, in Edinburgh, in Holland, in America, in Kenya. I've been thinking hard about what my father would have wanted to be said today. He would have found an excessive display of emotion very awkward. As he would an outpouring of praise, he was to the end a very modest man. But I think he would have wanted to put on record some of the key moments in his very rich and industrious life. Although he was by profession a lawyer, he retained the heart of a historian and was also blessed with a most extraordinary memory. Just a few weeks ago, he recited to his grandsons the number plate of every car he'd ever owned in chronological order. <laughs> Unerringly precise, he was the family fact checker long before Wikipedia and Google. So if something of a factual account of if this is something of a factual account of his life, forgive me. I think that's what he'd have wanted. Anthony Wilfred Bradley, who we know as Tony, was a son of Kent, born in Dover in February 1934 to a non-conformist teetotal family. His father, David, who'd been in the Friends Ambulance Corps in World War I, ran a family dyeing and cleaning firm, Scots, whose machinery was housed in caves carved into the white cliffs of Dover. His father was a kind man, a member of the magic circle, who enjoyed conjuring with comedy every bit as much as running the family business. 
Dad remembered his mother ironing silk handkerchiefs so they could be projected out of a bassoon. <laughs> his mother, Olive Bonzi, a missionary's daughter, was born in China amid the Boxer Rebellion in what is now the somewhat infamous city of Wuhan. Documenting the remarkable story of the Bonzi family became a preoccupation of my father's in later, later years. Before the city became synonymous with COVID, we were lucky enough to travel there, and it really thrilled Dad to locate the Hill Station bungalow where his mother had been happy as a little girl. Tony was the youngest of four, a brother Stephen and sisters Helen and Linda. Their childhood was interrupted by the war. As a boy, my father remembered seeing the Battle of Britain fought over his head. And after the, the retreat from Dunkirk in 1940, Tony was evacuated with his mother here to Oxford, where he found himself at Magdalen College School for a few years. Already, in his own words, a bit of a swat. He was apparently nicknamed Prof. The Latin master would give him the other pupils' homework to mark. <laughs> he returned to Dover after the war and spent the rest of his school days at Dover Grammar School. He was very proud of the school and made a number of lifelong friends there, some of whom I hope are watching today. He led the school's rather makeshift orchestra and gave what he said was a fine dramatic performance as the female lead viola in Twelfth Night. He loved to recount how he bought his first musical viola for eight pounds and 10 shillings from a Dover ironmonger. The instrument became a companion for the rest of his life. At home with his sister Linda, a talented pianist, he played duets, but he said in the Festival of Britain, Age 17, his real musical awakening came when he heard Bach's B minor mass in Canterbury Cathedral. He'd applied for Emmanuel College, Cambridge and got a scholarship in history, but in 1955 began studying not history, but law. At the time, there were 100 men doing law and just three women. So he enthusiastically signed up for summer international work camps in France and Finland, which fortuitously combined his commitment to peace and social justice with the welcome chance to meet some young women. <laughs> Perhaps not surprisingly, Tony graduated first class with distinction. As he once confided to me, with that degree, I could have traveled quite a long way, but ended up in Reading. <laughs> <laughs> but thank goodness he did. Article to the town clerk, he took the national solicitor's exams and came third in the country. He always teased my mother, Kathleen, that he might have done even better had the exams not coincided with meeting her. <laughs> she was, at the time, a young nurse from Accrington who lived over the Reading wine shop her mother ran, ran, a fact that happily wasn't a sticking point with Tony's teetotal parents. <laughs> they met in a church choir, and their first date in 1959 was an office outing to My Fair Lady, a hot ticket with Rex Harrison and Julie Andrews. I don't know if mum sang I could have danced all night that evening, but some magic occurred because just a fortnight and two days later, Tony and Kathleen were engaged. 62 years of marriage is testament to the remarkable team they made. And it's wonderful that John Geel, my father's best man, can be here today. In 1960, aged just 26, he became a fellow at Trinity Hall back in Cambridge. He also became a father first with me and then my sister Liz, born in the freezing winter of 1962 when the nappies went through the mangle and came out frozen stiff as boards. <laughs> One of his early acts at the college was to successfully argue to remove a clause in college statutes which would have excluded women students. At various times in my father's life, he was prepared to take an unconventional path and in the mid-60s, he and my mother headed on sabbatical to newly independent Tanzania to help establish the law faculty at Dar es Salaam University. They had three children by then. My sister Lucy had arrived. We lived overlooking the university campus with snakes in the storm drains and monitor lizards emerging from the bush into the back garden. As dad set about the important work of teaching the first generation of young East African lawyers trained in the region. Back from the equatorial heat and humidity of Dar, he applied for a position in the distinctly cooler climes of Edinburgh, and at the age of just 34 became Professor of Constitutional Law. For the next 21 years, he taught in the heart of that great city in Old College, with work colleagues like Mike Adler and Chris Hemsworth, who became friends for life. Edinburgh suited my father, its rich intellectual tradition, home of the Enlightenment, 
its proximity to the hills in which he loved walking, and its reputation as a magnet for culture and music. He played with the Edinburgh Symphony Orchestra and did a good job of inculcating his love of music in his growing family, most of the time willingly. Lottie, my youngest sister, had arrived and we moved into Nine Albert Terrace, an early Victorian house on a cobbled street with no central heating, too much black paint, but an amazing view over the Pentland Hills and a stalk on the roof. My mother worked her magic and transformed it into a very happy home. We were aware my father cut a mildly eccentric figure, this Englishman with an unusual Socratic beard without a moustache. Some ancient Greeks apparently believed beards to be superfluous discharge from a brain overcrowded with knowledge. So, so maybe that was it. But if he appeared a little unusual then, I've realized since he was in fact just ahead of his time. He cycled to work when no one thought of doing so. He recycled and repaired everything he could. He grew his own, was anti-consumerist. He hated being told what to buy. Truth is, he really, rarely shopped for anything other than books and music. And he was conscious of his carbon footprint before that was even a thing, in including an incident that became notorious in our family folklore when he turned down the heating in somebody else's home. <laughs> in the uh, self-centered way children see the world, we had little idea of what he was up to or curiosity. But we did know that family life had a rhythm rather akin to the Olympics. Every few years, a new edition of his key law textbook, Constitutional and Administrative Law, would be required. This seemed to us a Sisyphean task, nearly a thousand pages long. The tension would rise as each new chapter was painstakingly crafted underneath the angle poised light in the study. Under no circumstances was my father to be interrupted. What started as Wade and Phillips in its seventh edition became Wade and Bradley, and then just Bradley, and then Bradley and Ewing, as Dad chose a gifted former student, Keith Ewing, to shoulder arms as his co-author. Co he remained forever thankful for that decision. Meanwhile, again, largely unbeknownst to us, he was lending his time and skills pro bono in a variety of significant voluntary roles, including chairing the Edinburgh Council for the Single Homeless, and the Scottish Civil Liberties Trust. He had an innate concern for the rights of the vulnerable, for refugees, the homeless, rooted in a strong sense of social justice. He was a pacifist, ardently pro-European, he found Brexit heartbreaking, and had an instinctive sense of the importance of gender equality, which is good for a father of three daughters. These were not a portmanteau of easily held opinions, but positions he'd thought about over a lifetime, and my father thought a lot. Through all of this, my mother was at his side. They formed a remarkable and frankly surprising team. So different, and yet they complemented each other. Food was important in our house, and if I had to imagine my parents' relationship as a foodstuff, it would have to be marmalade. The irresistible combination of sweetness and citrus tang. At this time every year, and so sad he won't be here to do it this time, my father willingly fell into the role of my mother's marmalade sous chef, equipped with a vintage pressure cooker and preserving pan. While forging her own career as a health visitor, my mother mitigated my father's ten tendency to disappear in his study, ensuring the home remained a place for entertaining and socialising, and always with a homemade cake in the tin for our school friends to devour. Over his years teaching in Edinburgh and Cambridge, his students must number into the thousands. They include Baroness Hale, several judges, members of the Scottish Parliament, including Joanne Cherry, the writer Alexander McCall Smith. He advised Labour luminaries, Robin Cook and Tam DL regularly, debated with John Smith, and run, ran summer schools with another Anthony, Anthony Kennedy, Justice of the US Supreme Court, which became known as the Tony Show. One young postgraduate student, Ben Kangwana, with his wife Tabitha, became firm family friends, prompting a wonderful relationship between two extended clans that has cascaded down generations and across two continents. With typical modesty, 
He never mentioned the Anthony Bradley Prize that is now awarded in Edinburgh to the best student in public law and individual rights. At the age of 55, encouraged by his dear friend Stephen Sedley, whom he much admired, my father took the decision to become a barrister. If he started young as an academic, he now became the oldest junior in town. He was called to the bar along with 25-year-olds, and as the young barrister who sat next to us that evening said, imagine the poor sod who has to get up in court opposite him. He wrote the textbook. <laughs> Keith Ewing will talk a bit more about his life at the bar, but suffice to say he loved it at Cloisters, the company of his pupil master, Robin Allen, and colleagues, progressive, committed, and able. I think he felt he could now put into practice all he'd been cogitating over a lifetime as an academic. He was involved in some important cases and rather regretted he hadn't made the leap earlier. In time, he moved out to Oxfordshire, first very happily to Marcham, which coincided with the arrival of his five grandsons and granddaughter, and he became a wise and engaged grandpa. His belief in the importance of family continued in his refugee work as a trustee of Asylum Welcome, successfully supporting several families in their efforts to remain. One of the undoubted highlights for him was being able to join and get involved in the Abingdon District Music Society, playing the viola, as you've heard, with the symphony orchestra for over 20 years. He loved the musical company of these serious amateurs, the chance to carry on his musical education every Monday evening. It's a real shame he won't be here to play the Bach St. Matthew Passion at Easter. One of his favorite pieces. For the final chapter, he moved here to Cumnor seven years ago. My parents immediately made new friends and felt included in this warm, supportive community. He even brushed up his keyboard skills playing the piano at the Cumnor United Reformed Church. Typically, he took his diagnosis of pulmonary fibrosis in his stride. With incredible patience, he rarely, if ever, complained as his life became more restricted. We're very conscious of how fortunate we were at the end. Amid all the sadnesses and separations that COVID has wrought, Dad was able to have some really significant final chats with his friends, make a last trip to Scotland, and even rediscover the boarding house in Grasmere where Mum and he had stayed on honeymoon 62 years ago. I can report he retained his gentle demeanor to the last. He was reading The Guardian every day, listening to music, his beloved Bach and Finzi, and he remained with us just long enough to see Helen Morgan, the Lib Dem, take the North Shropshire seat, which gave him noticeable pleasure. <laughs> he reserved his frustration for an early Christmas present I'd bought him, a CD Bluetooth radio combination, which he called a loathsome machine. <laughs> My mother looked after him as she did all their married life with unstinting love, warmth, and a continuous supply of homemade soup. He had all the dedicated support of my wonderful sisters, brother-in-law, family and friends from all over, and the gentle medical ministrations of my wife Deborah, and some really dedicated carers. To the last, he was a complex man, fiercely principled, but not at all fierce, uncompromising in his views, but never judgmental of others. Incredibly articulate on the page, he struggled to express his emotions in person but managed nonetheless to be very warm. He spent much of his time in his books, but remained engaged with the world. He could seem severe and then deploy his characteristic wink to hilarious effect. I feel very fortunate to have had a father who led such an honorable and useful life, who used his intellect to accrue wisdom which he dispensed and shared with great generosity, modesty and kindness. But I think in the end, if I was channeling my father, he'd have wanted at this point to deflect the attention from himself and instead thank everybody here and those who could not be here but have traveled along the road with him for the part you played in his wonderful life. Thank you, Richard. Keith Ewing is going to tell us something of Tony's professional life.
<coughs> Thank you. That was a, a wonderful tribute uh, from, from Richard. Well, I've been um, asked to uh, say a few words about uh, Tony's uh, professional life as a teacher, a scholar, advisor, lawyer, and uh, law reformer. My first encounter with Tony uh, was uh, as a student uh, in his uh, constitutional law class in 1972 uh, at the uh, University uh, of Edinburgh. And I've known him since then uh, in many capacities, uh, not only as a teacher, but as a mentor, colleague, uh, co-author, uh, and, uh, and friend. I'd always felt that it had been a great privilege for me to uh, walk uh, in his company, and it's only reviewing his career over the last uh, two weeks or so that I now realize just how exceptional uh, that privilege uh, has been. In paying tribute to Tony's distinguished career, I would like to begin by uh, referencing uh, the role of his family, to which uh, uh, Richard uh, ha ha has referred, the importance of his family, it was something which uh, Tony himself would have been the first to uh, acknowledge. His career, it was obvious to, to all of us, is a, was a career which was defined by the security of a strong marriage of 60 years, uh, Kathleen a source of great support and a constant uh, companion. And as many of us have witnessed and as we've heard from uh, Richard, it was a career underpinned by an extremely close and loving and family, of whom he spoke often and of whose many achievements uh, he was uh, immensely uh, proud. Uh, Tony worked uh, in the fields of, uh, on the field of public law, uh, mainly uh, constitutional law uh, and uh, administrative law. And for those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with the law or with the, the legal process, this means that he was concerned uh, with the way the country is governed, he was concerned with the protection of our civil liberties uh, from restriction uh, by the state. And he was concerned with ensuring that people have effective redress uh, when they are treated unlawfully uh, or uh, unfairly. It was extremely important work, which in Tony's case was infused by a deep commitment to liberal values. He was aware of the strengths of the British Constitution, uh, very, very uh, fluent when he's speaking about its historical, political, and legal uh, dimensions. But he was concerned too about the weaknesses uh, of our governing arrangements, which he spent uh, much of his professional life uh, seeking to uh, improve. Now, as Richard has said, uh, Tony began his career at the University of Cambridge and he moved at the very early age, very young age of uh, 34, uh, to the Chair of Constitutional Law at the University of Edinburgh, which was where I uh, uh, first uh, encountered uh, him. And it has been said that he occupied uh, the chair uh, with uh, distinction and uh, vitality. Uh, and looking back uh, at his time in Edinburgh, I think we can say that that was a time in which Tony made a number of uh, different uh, contributions. Uh, and I think the first, uh, he's remembered, I think, first uh, for the uh, contribution which he made uh, to the development uh, of administrative law in Scotland in particular, at a time when uh, administrative law was not uh, the vibrant subject uh, which we know it uh, to be uh, today. Now, working with the, then with the Scottish Law Commission, uh, Tony set or laid the foundations of the modern system uh, of administrative law in Scotland. And Chris Himsworth, to whom Richard referred, uh, often uh, speaks uh, of Tony's contribution at that time uh, as having been uh, massive. But his contribution was not uh, confined uh, to the law of Scotland. He also contributed immensely to the development uh, of administrative law in England and Wales at, ta uh, at the same time uh, from his base uh, in uh, Edinburgh. And he did so by 
uh, working with Mike Adler on the development of the uh, tribunal system, by working with a group of uh, leading scholars in a very influential uh, committee, uh, leading to a very influential uh, report, uh, which led to a major uh, reform uh, of the uh, way by which uh, individuals uh, could access uh, the courts and the way in which uh, the process of administrative law was then developed uh, and, and improved. And he also, at the same time, uh, engaged uh, with uh, questions of uh, constitutional reform in these very early days, working on questions like uh, devolution and then uh, on, on human rights, uh, writing, I can remember, as a colleague, a very famous paper which uh, he wrote, uh, which, looking back now, with the benefit of hindsight, reads very much like a template for what became of the uh, Human Rights Act of 1998. So from these days in Edinburgh, he had produced a large body of uh, influential work. He was widely regarded as a scholar of exceptional learning uh, and distinction. He was also seen as the period's most, uh, one of the period's uh, uh, most active uh, and articulate analysts uh, using the journal Public Law, of which uh, he had become editor, as a platform for very, very powerful interventions into uh, public uh, affairs. And he was also, uh, as uh, Richard uh, reminds us, through his textbook, uh, he was engaged in the noble uh, endeavor of see seeking to provide uh, readers uh, with an informed understanding of the structure of the law and government under which they live. These are his, his words and the value of democracy and constitutionalism uh, which underlie that system uh, of uh, government. And I have to say, in that endeavor, uh, he succeeded uh, admirably. And I think it is sometimes forgotten that between 1974 and 1977, he completely rewrote uh, that book uh, at the time all 636 pages of it. It was a formidable uh, achievement. So when he retired from the chair in 1990, at the very young age of uh, 55, he could have looked back at that time uh, with satisfaction on a job uh, well done. It was a fulfilled career with an outstanding contribution to academic uh, and uh, public life. But in fact, uh, as we know, and as others uh, have commented, this was only uh, it, was, it was the end of, an, well, not even the end of an academic career, but it was the beginning of a new career uh, at the bar. So although he gave up his academic appointment at Edinburgh, he was to continue uh, to teach, to write, to edit, to analyse, to administer, and to advise for another uh, 30 years. And it's quite extraordinary, I think, that his final publication was produced only last year at the age of 87, uh, shortly after his birthday. And this appeared in the Connecticut Law Review, reflecting the fact that uh, he had uh, North American academic friends as well. But the fact is that he never stopped working. He never stopped writing. And he never stopped uh, uh, feeling uh, about the things or caring for the things uh, that, 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 uh, that he did uh, write about uh, through, throughout his career. He continued to be exercised by the conduct uh, of government, or the misconduct of government uh, as he saw it. So the second half of his career, the second half of his professional life was dominated by uh, practice at the bar. And this, this, I think, was very important. It gave to him the opportunity to have a lived experience of the law about which he had uh, been so engaged uh, as, as an academic. So on leaving Edinburgh, as uh, Richard uh, has pointed out, uh, he was offered a place at Cloisters, uh, where, uh, according to uh, Sir Stephen Sedley, he was a tower of strength with his compendious, though never flaunted, knowledge of constitutional and public life. His first cases uh, took him to employment tribunals all over the country, uh, representing the interests of uh, military personnel, uh, hundreds of whom at that time had been dismissed unlawfully uh, because of their uh, pregnancy. But he appeared in courts uh, at all levels, and he's remembered by his uh, pupil master, uh, Robin Allen, as having been a distinguished 
advocates in court. He's best known for uh, one particularly famous case, the Chagos Islanders case, a case involving a group of uh, islanders who'd ex been expelled from their homes in the Indian Ocean to make way for a military base during the uh, Cold War. This was uh, important work with which, uh, in which he'd taken part at various steps in the uh, litigation process. But it was his involvement, I think, although this was important even more so, uh, was his involvement in the case of M, a Zairean uh, trade unionist, uh, uh, who had been uh, the victim, I think, of persecution uh, because of uh, his involvement in a strike in his uh, home uh, na native land. Now, grounded in Civil War principles, uh, this case is said to be uh, one of the most significant decisions of uh, modern uh, constitutional uh, law. Uh, the court rejecting the government's claim that they, are, that they have no obligation, that, that, that they comply with the law as a matter of grace, but not as a matter of uh, obligation. And Tony's contribution to this case uh, was said by his colleagues to have been uh, critical. So the 20 years that uh, Tony spent at the bar was coincided not only with his uh, practice in the courts, but also with uh, big constitutional changes uh, that took place uh, after 1997. Uh, and Tony played a big part uh, in that process uh, of change. He'd written about it while uh, an academic uh, in, in Edinburgh but he was also appointed uh, to the position of legal advisor of the Constitutional Committee, or the Constitution Committee of the uh, House of Lords, which had been established in uh, 2011. Now the committee had decided, sorry, the committee had been appointed in 2001. It had decided initially, the committee had decided initially that it did not need a legal advisor, that the appointment of such a person could not be uh, justified. It quickly changed its mind, uh, and within a few years, the committee was reporting that it had been able to cover such an extensive amount of material to do so much work only because of the excellent work of its legal advisor, uh, Professor uh, Anthony uh, Bradley. Now, it was fitting that Tony should have been appointed uh, to this position. Not only was he our preeminent uh, constitutional uh, lawyer, but his work had been relied upon uh, for many years, going back to his Edinburgh days, by parliamentarians and officials. In their terms, he was one of the great constitutional authorities. He was revered across the political spectrum for his wisdom and balance. He was someone whose advice, it was said in a recent House of Commons debate, someone whose advice politicians should aspire to follow. And it was fitting also, not only that he should take this uh, role uh, as a legal advisor to the Constitution Committee, but fitting also that he should have been appointed as an honorary QC in recognition of his exceptional contribution uh, throughout his uh, legal uh, career. Now, Tony, by this stage in his life, towards the end of his uh, working life, he, had, he, was now, he now had an academic base at the Institutes of European and Comparative Law at the University of Oxford. And from this, he continued to pursue uh, other long-standing interests. And these included his interests in Commonwealth affairs, uh, which had been nurtured uh, during the early days at Trinity Hall and taken him to uh, uh, Tanzania, as Richard uh, has explained. But he continued to work with the Commonwealth Secretariat advising on administrative law uh, th throughout uh, multiple countries uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Commonwealth. He was appointed also at this time to the Council of Europe's uh, Venice Commission uh, for Democracy Through Law, and that then took him on a journey which would see him advise on uh, constitutional reform and constitutional change in many uh, East European countries after the end uh, of the uh, Cold War. He lectured and participated in events all over the world in what was a wonderful uh, career. Now, as Richard had said, and as those of us who knew him in a professional capacity uh, uh, could confirm, Tony was a strongly principled man. He was hugely respected and widely admired. 
he was held not only in the highest esteem, but also with the warmest affection. He was generous and tolerant, qualities which shone through his professional life and privately in his dealings with friends and colleagues. His words were always very measured and meticulous, never resorting to exaggeration or hyperbole. He was a very modest man, but he was a great lawyer and a great uh, scholar. But above all, he was universally acknowledged as a man of extraordinary kindness and compassion, a man who deeply enriched the lives of those of us who had the real privilege to know him. Officers are going to play the Sky Boat song. We were singing the Sky Boat song to Dad as he gently passed away. Unknown to us, two miles down the road in Botley, his grandson, Joe, had taken out a Christmas CD, replaced it with a Scottish folk song CD, and had chosen out of 20 songs the Sky Boat song. It was a, an amazing coincidence and a wonderful affirmation of that moment at the end of Dad's life. And I've also discovered another lovely coincidence. The words of the Sky Boat song were written by a Kentish man to a Scottish melody. That evening, all of the family were gathered, all the children, grandchildren, wonderful daughter-in-law and son-in-law. And this was three weeks ago to this day. Last year, Dad showed us a diary he kept from 1966, 
of a very different three-week period, a detailed written description of a driving safari, driving from Tanzania to Uganda and back. He was driving a second-hand VW variant. He took it on boat across Lake Victoria. He navigated roads that had been swept away. He had two spare tires but didn't get a single puncture. All the details of the terrain, the mileage, and the pe petrol consumption are there. Reading it now, who would imagine there were three children of five years old and under on the back seat? We were barely mentioned. <laughs> there was Richard, myself, and Lucy as a toddler still in nappies. Lottie was born two years later in Edinburgh. His writing reveals a single-minded and focused man with a cautious, measured approach to adventure, clearly suited to life as an academic lawyer. But how did this translate into being the wonderful father he was? My dear older brother Richard described Dad's style of parenting as gently laying down a road map. He showed us the road he had chosen. He didn't attempt to control, so gentle and reasonable. Our family had great pleasure reading emails, cards, and letters with your words describing Dad's attributes. Alongside a towering intellect, the qualities most often mentioned were kindness, thoughtfulness, and taking time to listen. Obviously very important as a child to have that. Tony Bradley's four children and six grandchildren have been lucky to enjoy his kindness. We would add fairness, which is hard with children, patience, and plenty of it except in driving lessons. And he showed his patience in his consistency of manner. Our mother would add reliability. Let's remember the VW variant and no puncture. She loved the fact that dad was a one-off. Together, our mother and father made an incredible team. It was a joint partnership that expressed a full involvement with the world. Now, another attribute must be mentioned, Dad's sense of humor, which was notable, could be quite unusual, whether intentionally, unintentionally, and sometimes we weren't sure which. <laughs> For the celebration of their 60th wedding anniversary, Grandpa Tony devised a board game of their 60 years together. It was touching to know that he'd devised this game for the next generation to hear about their stories, not least for Rory and Matilda, the youngest grandchildren. This game contained plenty of dad's humor. It was a one-off and a roadmap of sorts. Dad could also enjoy slapstick. On holiday once, we were eating butterscotch angel delight for pudding. Richard got a bit carried away with the smell of it, and he wouldn't stop moving his nose. Some of us would call him a show-off. I personally think it was just exuberance. But Dad got hold of his head and pushed it into the butterscotch angel delight. A story I like, which has an example of his parenting style, his sense of humor, and his use of words. As slightly older teenage children, we'd suddenly got interested in the Ouija board. So we cut out letters of the alphabet and put them on a tray. And all four children had their fingers on an upturned glass and waited to see what would happen. Nothing did. There was much hysterical laughter. And it was getting late. And Dad said, can I join in? So he came along. And we had five fingers on that upturned glass. It started moving. <laughs> T. I. So it's getting exciting. M, <laughs> E, time, F, O, R, four, <laughs> B, E, D. Dad very rarely shouted. He solved problems, including humor. That was his way of communicating. My sister Lottie said that Dad may not outwardly show emotion, but he has always calmly been there, incredibly supportive in a practical way. He always knew what was needed without being asked. The gentle roadmap again. 
Lucy, Lottie and myself would agree that his practical help was frequent, whether literal support tying up roses in a new home, giving encouraging words of support, you're capable of so much, or calmly retrieving a lost dissertation within his computer. Let's not forget his influence with finding the right words over years watching him type on an Olivetti typewriter, then a word processor, and then a touchscreen personal computer. Which brings us up to date. Dad's roadmap continues with his grandchildren. Jack, the eldest, said how much he'd enjoyed spending more time with Grandpa in the autumn. Grandson, Larry, told him that he'd moved to Limehouse. Grandpa immediately shared a historical perspective and talked about Lloyd George's Limehouse speech of 1909. <laughs> And when it comes to universities most associated with Grandpa, Adam is studying in Edinburgh, and this year he's spending at Dad's beloved Paris at the Sorbonne. Joseph, who felt particularly close to his Grandpa, is at Trinity Hall, which is where Dad's academic career began. This brings us full circle to the summation in legal parlance, or the coda, as those who followed a musical path would call it. I haven't yet mentioned music, Dad's playing of it with all of his family over years, whether on violin, viola, or piano, and with an extended family of musicians, some of whom are here today. I'm sure he enjoyed music for its breadth of communication without words. Please give thanks to A.W. Bradley as father and grandfather as a tribute to his memory, I will leave you with the thought that as a man so skillful at using words, how much of importance he conveyed and communicated without words through his gentle roadmap. Charlotte is now going to read an epitaph of a friend by Robert Burns. So I chose Robert Burns as it reminds me of my dad accompanying me on the piano while I sang Burns songs as a child. An honest man here lies at rest, as ere God with his image blessed. The friend of man, the friend of truth, the friend of age and guide of youth. Few hearts like his with virtue warmed, few heads with knowledge so informed. If there's another world, he lives in bliss. If there is none, he made the best of this. We're running a little bit um, late, um, so could we have the reflection for just a couple of minutes, please? Thank you so much.
come now to our prayers and the response is printed in your order of service. Let us pray to the Lord our God, making known our heart's desire for Tony. God of our journey, you have called us to follow in the way of Christ even to death. By the victory of the cross, lead Tony through death to resurrection, where Christ has gone before us to prepare our place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous God, you call us to judgment, to the place where right and truth prevail. Examine us with love and show Tony your mercy, for without it none of us may stand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever-living God, you have promised new life to all who are found in Christ. Grant Tony the life of your eternal joy and peace, and clothe him with the life of your Son, whom not even death could hold. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Saviour, in life and death, who reigns and lives with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God for ever and ever. Amen. And we say the Lord's Prayer together, which is written in your service booklet. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. It says in your order of service that I'm going to give a short talk, but friends, time is pressing and we have an allotted slot at the crematorium where I will read the talk then. So we move now to our final hymn, which is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
eternal God, go before us to lead our ways from death to life. Go with us to keep in the paths of peace. Gather us with Tony into the company of those who praise you forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Romans 8. We may be certain of this, neither death nor life, no angel, no ruler, nothing that exists, nothing still to come, not any power or height or depth, nor anything created can ever separate us from the love of God, which we have seen in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please stand as you are able. Let us commend Tony to God. Into your keeping, O merciful God, we commend your servant, Tony Bradley. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the joy of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labours. Lord, who renew the face of the earth, gather to yourself Tony Bradley, whom we have loved and love still, and grant to him those things so beautiful which have not been seen or heard nor human heart imagined. Eternal God, before whose face the generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who have departed this life in your faith and love. And especially now, we praise you for Tony, and that forever in your care, any sorrow or sickness is ended. We give thanks for all your goodness towards Tony, for all he has accomplished by your grace, and for all that he has and, and is still sorry, and for all that he was and still is to those who love him. And Father, help us to remember that we hurt much now because we love much, and may we be glad for that. God of all, we pray for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant them your peace. Let light perpetual shine upon them. And in your loving wisdom and almighty power, work in them the good purpose of your perfect will. And support us, O Lord, all the day long until the shadows lengthen, the evening comes, the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and all our work is done. Then, in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at the last through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God be at your side through every twist, turn, sadness and joy of life, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be with you and all those you love in this world and the next, and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>